hustling back and forth about whether to give you a lecture just about all the intricacies of ringworm or whether I really wanted to talk about the intricacies of ringworm in the context of an outbreak. And I came down deciding that I want to do it within this context of an outbreak, partly because I really want to make sure you're all exposed to understanding how to manage outbreaks, and partly because, um, in my experience, in terms of a life-saving um, thing, there is more problems happening from mismanagement or misunderstanding that happens in the course of either a real outbreak or somebody thinking there's an outbreak than there is in misunderstandings about individual treatment. So what I'm going to try to do is sort of talk about um, diagnosis, recognition, and treatment in the context of an outbreak. Um, just want to let you know that Dr. Moriello just walked in and sat down all quietly. <laughs> but that's OK. Um, yeah, and then she's got to rattle her lunch around a little bit. But I want you guys to know that um, this would have come whether she walked in or not, that all of the work that I've done on ringworm is really in partnership with her. So she's really my partner in crime um, for all of this and has been um, for frighteningly over 10 years, probably, right? <laughs> so, um, so it's always fun to be able to talk about this uh, in that way. So what I'm going to start out with is sort of give you what I think of as the rules. When we think about outbreaks, the first thing I want to think about for a particular disease is what are the rules about this disease? What, what's the rules to this? It's not a game because it's not a lot of fun, but what are the rules we have to be sure we're aware of? Um, and Iowa, just so you know, in this room, sadly, uh, bells ring at sort of random intervals. It doesn't mean the class is over <laughs> for us. Um, so it has a pleomorphic presentation. We see lots of, this can look a lot of different ways, is basically what that means. There's many different species of dermatophytes, so these are kind of the challenges. The lesions may or may not be obvious. Wood slamp exam, though, highlights fluorescence of M. canis, and you're going to see I'm going to come back to that over and over again because that is like our ace in the hole. <laughs> Fungal culture is the gold standard for diagnosis. DTM, so dermatophyte test media, is the standard growth media. How many of you have ever seen a DTM? Fantastic. Um, it, it has white, fluffy growth on dermatophyte test media, and a positive microscopic ID is required for diagnosis. So if you only remember one rule, remember that rule. Um, there's more lives been lost in this world <laughs> by a misunderstanding of that basic principle probably than anything else having to do with ringworm. So yes, the dermatophyte test media will turn red if there's pathogenic growth, but it also turns red when there's lots of other things growing on it too. So red just means, hey, look at me. Um, but then you got to really look. Direct exam of Woods positive hairs is like a snap test for dermatophytosis, and we're going to talk about that. Adult cats are difficult to infect in research settings. So when Dr. Moriella was doing clinical research in a research setting, they used to have to put e-collars on cats so they wouldn't just groom everything off <laughs> to try to, you know. So adult cats are difficult to infect in research settings. Now, transfer that to a shelter setting where the cats aren't feeling well, they may be depressed, they may be sick, they may not be grooming and, and doing the normal things that cats do. And we know that it's probably going to be a lot easier to infect adult cats. But just so that you have that understanding that cats are fastidious creatures. And if they get stuff on their fur, most of the time, they're going to be able to get rid of it. Highly contagious with a question mark. It is highly contagious. Do we see it whipping through animal shelters? Not usually especially not once the animals are under treatment, especially not once animals have been recognized. In shelters that are not doing good identification, not doing good recognition, yes, it is highly contagious <laughs> to humans as well as animals. So undiagnosed is the highest risk. The environment, stress, and general health play a huge role. There's lots of different routes of infection because it's very good at just hanging out in the environment. About a two to three week incubation period. 
So those are really our general understandings that we need to have. That's our challenge. Those are the rules for how this disease works. Really simple, right? That's like the cliff notes. So let's start with our ringworm outbreak. We have initial contact from somebody who thinks there's an outbreak. The things we need to find out are who contacted us, why did they contact us, which animals are involved, and this leads to step one, collecting a history and clinical response. So the key concept when we're talking about an outbreak response is really to stop the cycle of transmission. We obviously want to treat the treatable as well, but we really want to stop this before it gets any bigger. That should be really our first, first main key point. So we know that the problems in doing that are that there's, there's this long diagnostic period, if we're talking about fungal cultures, is ease of transmission, clinical signs may overlap with many other skin conditions, and there can be environmental contamination as well. So here is the first email. I'm going to do a little case study with you. Hello, doctor. I'm in the tail end, I hope and pray, of a ringworm outbreak in the shelter. I have some specific questions, and I would really appreciate any advice you can offer. We have the old-style plastic-covered wood cages that are used in some of the rooms here, unfortunately. They're not up to standard, but funds are limited. The unfortunate thing is that the ringworm first was brought in with a cat that was housed in the rooms with these bad cages. We've triple cleaned, bleach, vircon, etc., a few times, and I've swiffered and cultured the room. So far, no growth but it's only been five days. I recommended to the management to purchase stainless steel cages, but at $10,000, it takes some convincing. Unfortunately, we also don't use stainless steel litter boxes. She goes on about that. Um, my question, what would you recommend in this case? Ideally, yes, new cages, but I fear we have to work with what we've got. Any questions on cleaning? Is there any hope or any input, even more ammo, as to why we should get new cages? My other question, up in the adoption center, we have metal cat walkways, and they go on, and she sent pictures. Then she says, thank you. I appreciate all the help and advice. More, more pics to follow in case it's too large a file. I was out of town, so I didn't get the first email. This is the second email. Hi, doctor, once again, just a few days later. I just wanted to email you again so that maybe I could be top of the list with my concerns since you've been away from the clinic. I have an update on my ringworm struggles. Unfortunately, we've had a few cultures come back positive. I randomly chose one cat per room. I'm sending out those cultures to be ID'd by a lab, which will take at least seven days, if not longer. What's wrong? Oh, she gets a gold star. So what she said was that she called the cultures positive, but she clearly hasn't identified them yet because she's saying she's just getting ready to send them out. So she thinks she has a ringworm outbreak, but she hasn't identified, um, she hasn't identified the cultures. Unfortunately, the CEO, director, et cetera, are now leaning towards a depopulation. We have under 400 animals. Decision will be finalized this afternoon. I am mortified, but understand. So please, if you can, answer my question. So what's the problem? Why am I talking about outbreaks with you? <laughs> right? So here are about 400 animals at risk when we haven't even gotten the diagnostics that we need to get to know whether we have ringworm in this situation or not. Um, to me, um, that's a really, really frightening situation. It was a really frightening situation. Um, if you want to Google it a little bit, this is from um, the Ontario SPCA. They had a uh, a huge public outcry. They actually announced that they were going to depopulate. They didn't, but no one ever believed them that they didn't um, because of this huge outcry. There were death threats. There were all sorts of horrors associated with this. And when we went further back, they've now done a huge internal and external review of the situation. We really couldn't find anything that looked like a real positive um, in that population. So I tell you this story because I hope that you will remember it forever <laughs> and be sure not to ever think just because a culture turns red that that means you're having an outbreak in your shelter or even that the animal is positive until you've identified that culture. Okay, so step one, initial evaluation. What has already been done? 
So we want to collect the history and clinical signs. And one of the things I hope you can gather from that email that I'm sharing is that's what I was able to do reasonably from that email. And Sarah did a great job picking up just one little sentence like that sometimes will totally tip you off that something isn't quite right as you're collecting the history. So you need to listen carefully. Is disease even present? Well, maybe, but maybe not. So we need, that's the thing you want to be able to identify is when we need to look further. Is, an, is it an outbreak? How, what's the severity of the disease? What other clinical signs do we see? Who's affected? How many are affected? And then start looking at things like husbandry practices so we can get a sense of how likely it is that this has spread all over. One of the cases that Dr. Moriel and I were the most impressed by in terms of the completely thorough spread of disease, we could sort of guess that that's what we were going to see based on what they were telling us about the flow of animals through the shelter and the way the animals were cared for. Um, we wouldn't have expected that if they were having a problem with ringworm in that shelter, it would have been contained. We would have expected it would not be contained, and that was, in fact, the truth. Um, what testing has already been done, i.e., is it just red color or more? Veterinary screening for lesions, was that done? Was a woods lamp and direct exam of fluorescing hairs? Or fungal culture? Again, here's another. There was another really interesting case in Wisconsin just last week where a shelter called Giant Panic concern about depopulation, considering depopulation. When I started talking to them about their woods lamp exams, I had a really strong suspicion that it wasn't what they thought they were seeing. And I actually, because it was Wisconsin, which is really nice, I was actually able to have them drive down to Madison with 10 cats. And in fact, what they had was an outbreak of doxycycline covering a bunch of cats. Um, and you know, we laughed. And, it, you know, it's funny, and I made jokes with them about it, and I can't tell you how much that made my day. But the alternative would have been, you know, depopulation of an entire shelter. So we need to really be, be careful that, that you guys understand and then every effort you can make to help and train. We need more training um, on this topic so that this stuff doesn't happen. So step two is planning. Um, and this cat is obviously doing lots of planning all day long. <laughs> um, what needs to be in the plan? What do we need to think about? Well, we need to think about a clean break, and I'm going to come back and talk about that. We need to think about, well, how are we going to evaluate clinical signs? What kind of diagnostics are we going to do, and how much are they going to cost? Um, how are we going to do an initial risk assessment to sort of figure out, like, just the basics so that we can figure out, do we need to go forward? Do we not need to go forward? Oh my god, is this going to take us the next year to clean up? Or you know, is this something that's a minimal intervention? And then um, how we're going to collect our diagnostic results. So clean break is something that one of the reasons I wanted to give this presentation so that you guys would be introduced to that topic. It's a pretty simple idea. And for lack of any better way of saying it, you can kind of use a metaphor of thinking of the exposed population as being sort of dirty, and the new incoming population as being relatively clean. And what you want to do is keep your dirty and your clean separate. So you want to keep your exposed group separate from your unexposed group. And what we're going to do as we're going through sort of responding to the outbreak is you're going to keep resorting between clean and dirty. So at first, because you don't know, everyone who's in the shelter now is dirty, right? Everyone who's coming in is clean. Is everyone who's coming in clean? Maybe, maybe not. So everybody's sort of shaking their heads. Could be, could be not. The worst possible thing you can do when you're trying to establish a clean break is not be really careful about who's coming in, right? Because you go to all this work to establish this clean break, and then random kitten coming in with ringworm goes unrecognized and it exposes your whole clean section. So when you establish the clean break, you've got to make sure that you're keeping your clean area clean. So um, basically what we do is we just divide between the exposed population and new incoming cats. We try to have separate staff, separate equipment, both areas treated as isolation. 
Um, if you can't do that, then the alternative to that is separate clothing and good training and good practices to really make sure those two areas are staying separate. Step four involves screening the population. So get into the habit of doing an exam the same way every time. Document the lesions if you can. It really helps to use a physical exam form. For me, I have this whole rule about start at the nose, go to the toes, and then do the tail. Um, and I do my exam for looking for lesions the exact same way every single time. I do, um, I start at the nose, I go down, I do the toes, I flip them over, I call it looking under the hood. Then I turn them back, and then I look at the top of the tail. So I look at the underside of the tail when I've got them upside down, set them back up again, and then I go down the tail. Um, I'm sure Dr. Moriello probably taught me that. <laughs> um, so when you're checking for lesions, you really want to be looking for inflammatory abnormalities of the skin. We're not usually looking for quiet lesions. Sometimes after treatment, ringworm lesions will start to look more like quiet lesions, but before treatment, we're really looking for inflammatory lesions. I see lots of shelters that put cats into quarantine because they've got like hair loss where their collar was, things like that. So you really want to be able to have staff understand the difference between really a quiet area of hair loss and an inflammatory lesion. Sites you want to pay particular attention to are things like inside the ears, and hopefully you guys can appreciate right here. Um, where there's a little bit of crusting in here. These are really easy to miss. Or, for example, if a cat has really significant ear mites, sometimes people will sort of write that off and say, oh, there's this inflammatory lesion, but it's because of ear mites. There's no reason in the world that a cat can't have ear mites and ringworm. And in fact, having ear mites probably sets them up to get ringworm a lot more easily because there's breaks in the skin there. Um, so again, nose, eyes, and whiskers, tips of toes, and bottoms of the feet are places that I often see missed. And this has to do with you know, making sure that people are looking under the hood. When we first started the program that we started at Dane County Humane Society, we would get culture results back. And these were the sites where we usually found people had missed the lesions. And it was great to see how quickly the staff, it like became kind of this competition to you know, not have any lesions sneak through. Once they knew where they were missing, then they'd, they'd pick up on that even faster. So that kind of training is really important to give them that feedback. OK, so here's a little kitten. In Iowa, you guys can answer your, you can put it in the chat what you think. This little kitten's got, does he have a runny eye? Maybe yes, maybe no. Does he have ringworm? How many in this room, how many think he's got ringworm? Or how many think he might? ringworm and we need to look into it further. Say about 50%, oh no, maybe 75% of you think maybe. Do you have anything from I? Okay. What about now? <laughs> so we got to look at the whole guy, right? It would be really easy to assume that this was like a runny eye or something. Um, but this actually lit up like a Christmas tree as soon as we put the wood lamp on it. And I have a picture to show, I think, in a minute. But what we can see is then behind his ears, we can see this kind of crusty, thickening. Um, in his case, it's bilaterally, which could be kind of confusing because it looks so symmetrical. Um, and then we can also see all along the ear margin as well. Um, this was one crusty little fellow. Um, thank goodness we have a wood lamp, because a lot of the time the wood lamp can just clear up these questions right away. Um, I'm sure that you're not learning this here, but in lots of vet schools, um, and even when I was in vet school, which was um, not that long ago, <laughs> you know, people used to say that, oh, only about 50% of ringworm cats will glow under a wood lamp. Um, in our experience, at least in animal shelters, what we've seen is probably closer to about 90, maybe even more um, glow. I, I'd like to even say like 99% of them glow. Like it's so rare for them not to glow and their infection to be clinically significant. Every now and then we pick up these cases where cats have lesions and trichophyton. It's really, really rare. Microsporum canis is by far, by far, the most common pathogen, and at least in our hands, most of it glows. So really remember, 
Lots of people used to think, well, only 50% will glow. Why should I bother with a wood lamp? Bother with a wood lamp. Because when you see this, just go ahead. You know, you, you, know, you want to back it up with a culture in an ideal circumstance. You want to back it up with a direct exam, which I'm going to show you. But this gives you an answer almost immediately. And at least it puts you on enough alert and enough suspicion to do the further diagnostics that we're going to talk about. So ringworm glow basics. Ringworm glow is usually apple green, occasionally blue white. And that's kind of what we're seeing here. I'm not exactly sure. Karen, do you know why sometimes it glows blue white like that? Longer, uh, it will it will still turn green. So yeah, so I, people get confused sometimes because it has that kind of blue white glow. Um, if it's really characteristic, and when I'm saying characteristic, what you should be looking for, and what this picture shows really nicely, it's very difficult to get good pictures of ringworm fluorescence because you're in the dark. Um, but the whole hair should be glowing, and it's not crusted on. If you can flick it off, it's not ringworm. Um, if it's smeared on, it's not ringworm. Um, so what you'll see is these individual little tiny speckly glowing hairs. Sometimes all those hairs get broken off, so what you'll see is the skin and then these little tiny pinpricks, which are actually the little stubble of hair in the hair follicles, and that's what's glowing. So you'll see these little starry night kind of deal, especially the base of the hair. This, I think, will explain, and this to me really helps people understand what you're looking for with the wood lamp. So the fungus is growing in the hair follicle, and it's kind of painting the hair, coating the hair as the hair is growing out. But it's not coating it with something that's going to just wipe off or flick off. What will glow? So I already talked about this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here. But, but just really recognize this is, to me, one of the most important tools in managing ringworm in a shelter. And I think, you know, every shelter should be doing this at intake to every cat who comes in the door, not just those who have lesions. Because the other thing that's great with the wood lamp is sometimes a lesion that you can't really see with just your, your eye in regular light, you put a wood lamp on it and, it's, and you're like, oh, you know, or that, like that little kitten with the runny nose. Sometimes you'll see things that you just didn't see with the lights on. They look really different. Who knows what this is on this kitten? It's hard for you guys to see. That's teramycin. I hear people sort of whispering it. So that's teramycin. What about on the paw? Also teramycin, right? Because we rub our eyes after somebody puts teramycin on. Um, and so this is a really different color. It's really yellow, not very green, not blue-white. Usually it can be wiped off or washed off, not always. But see how different it looks? See how it looks like a smear, schmear? That's the difference. So the next thing, once you find your positive hair, is to do a direct exam of the hair. And this is just a list of the supplies that you'll need. Um, when I first uh, was out of vet school, I thought that I always had to use chlorphenolac. And in fact, Dr. Morello gave me my own little bottle of chlorphenolac that I used to keep locked in my desk drawer because it destroys microscope lenses. And so I didn't want anybody else to use it. And so I always kept it put away. Then one day, I didn't have it, and I wanted to look. And so I just used mineral oil. And I was like, oh, this works great. So mineral oil works just fine. You don't have to lock it in your desk. The difference is that the chlorphenolac or the KOH work as a clearing agent, so sometimes it makes it a little easier to see. It makes things a little clearer. I've always found I can see it just fine with mineral oil, and the pictures I'm going to show you are using mineral oil. So um, in a shelter setting, I, I always recommend people just use mineral oil because the risk of demolishing your microscope lens is probably not worth the added visual ease. Um, so when you're, once you've found a kitty who glows, what you've got here is a wood lamp. This is the edge of my wood lamp. Here's a glowing hair, which you can't see because the regular lights are on. I'm going to take a little hemostat and just, I like to just pluck the individual hairs that I can see glowing. 
so I know that I got one that glowed. And then I look at it with the wood lamp, and I put it on the microscope slide, and then I look at the microscope slide and make sure I got one that glowed. Karen tends to sort of pluck a whole bunch from that area more and then make sure one of those was glowing, just different preferences. Um, you need a fourth hand, that's why I put this here, because somebody's got to hold the cat and somebody's got to hold the wood lamp. So you need third hand, fourth hand. Um, here's your drop of mineral oil or, clor or chlorphenolac. You put the hair in the drop. Then you set up your microscope, you put your woods lamp here on the edge, look through the viewers, and you'll actually be able to find the glowing hair on the slide. Then you turn the woods lamp off, you turn the regular microscope light on, and this is what it's going to look like. Here's the hair, this dark area here, and then hopefully you can appreciate all these little tiny spores all stacked up along the outside of the hair. Here's a really nice example of a hair and all the destruction of the normal hair with all this spores, all these spores collected on the outside. And as a comparison, here are more normal hairs on the same microscope. So this is an infected hair that's broken. Here is an even higher powered view where we can see all these little tiny spores. And again, I'm joking, it's not a snap test, but with training, and with some skill, when I started learning how to do this, I always backed up my results with a fungal culture until I felt like I was always right. Um, and so that's the way to train yourself, is to always look and then see how your answers correlate with the fungal culture. Um, so it's not a snap test, but it's pretty dang good. Okay. So now you know how to screen, what kind of screening protocol are you going to use. Um, this is basically what we recommend. So animals come in, the first thing you're going to do is do a screening exam, plus or minus a culture. Um, some shelters culture every animal that comes in. For other shelters, they just don't have the resources to do that. And then they're going to culture animals that they think are suspect. As long as every animal is getting a woods lamp exam, I think that's a perfectly fine approach to take. So the first question is, are there lesions? And we're going to ask that about everybody. And then we're also going to say, are they woods lamp positive? About everybody. From there, we go into this kind of yes or no, positive woods lamp. We're going to do the direct exam we just talked about. And we're going to treat those animals as truly infected. We're going to back up our results with a culture. And if for some reason that culture comes back negative, then we're going to reevaluate the situation. If you've got good training and you know what you're doing with your direct exam, that's not going to happen very often. On the other hand, if the woods exam is negative, but we said, ah, oh, they do have lesions, then we're going to do an, a, a, sort of a risk assessment based on lesions. Um, do we want to say, well, we don't think these are such serious lesions and move the animal on, or do we want to say, let's wait? And usually, if we're seeing lesions there, we're going to wait um, and, and see. If the cat is in a really high risk setting and the lesion is really suspicious, even without a positive woods lamp, some shelters will begin to treat so that they're not wasting the time while they're waiting for the culture. On the other hand, they might be wasting the treatment um, and the stress on the animal. So you really have to just kind of make an evaluation of doing that. Um, so again, we've got our clean break here. We've got new incoming cats. We're going to be screening them, as I was talking about, so we don't have somebody sneaking in on us. Because if we screen them and they're positive, then they have to move over to the dirty side of our clean break, or the exposed side of our clean break. So the next thing, then, is to go and evaluate the risk. How high is the risk based on the results of this clinical assessment that we did? So if this was an outbreak, what we would be doing is first figuring out, well, who do we think is in the exposed group? Is it the whole shelter? Is it just one room of a shelter? And ideally, you would try to at least look at some cats in every room to make that assessment. But if you really feel, based on sort of the, the risk scenario, that you can focus on just one area what, or whatever area you decide to focus on, you need to look at each and every animal. Um, whether that's you and you're consulting with the shelter and you're the veterinarian in the shelter, or whether that's another veterinarian and you're actually working with that veterinarian. Ideally, we always want it to be a veterinarian who's actually screening and looking at the animal. Um, we really do see a difference. 
um, when we can get a veterinarian involved, even when we're working on these cases long distance in helping shelters. Sometimes we can't. Um, and we try to find somebody who has enough training to really understand what they're looking for. Um, but in general, we really want to try to find a veterinarian to do these physical, these exams for lesions. So step seven is the first shuffle. And so um, this is where we do sort of, we rearrange our clean break. So first we created our clean break. And now we're going to say, well, OK, now we've got the results of this first exam and wood lamp evaluation. Now we're going to take the animals and divide them into really three categories. The first is the ones that we're almost certain are infected based on wood lamp and direct exam. And hopefully, we're going to be able to treat those. The next is, you think you're kind of suspicious, but we really just don't know. Hopefully, we can separate those. And the other is, we don't see anything wrong with you. You're still in the exposed group, but we're going to think about ways that we can just move you through the system. In some cases, what that means is just a single topical treatment and on your way. In some cases, it means just you're on your way. It depends, again, on the level of risk that we assess to be happening in that particular organization. Does that make sense? Okay. The next thing we want to do, and this actually, it's always a, a tricky thing to decide where we want to put this piece. <laughs> because you're trying to do all these things at once. You don't want everything to take forever. Really, environmental sampling can often play an important role in terms of evaluating the overall risk. Um, one thing, again, in Ontario, we saw very little environmental contamination. I mean, like, two spores or something. So how likely is it that there's a ringworm outbreak if we sample the environment and we see that there's just there's nothing there? Um, it's very unlikely. So sometimes we'll really push to get shelters to do this piece a little quicker. Sometimes we know there's a problem and we just need to get going, and then we come back around to environmental sampling. Um, Swiffers were great. Um, <laughs> my favorite story about Swiffers is when we were in the midst of having first discovered that Swiffers worked really great to do this. Uh, Dr. Moriella went to Target and bought like this giant stack of Swiffers. That was only after contacting the company that makes Swiffers to ask them if they would be willing to donate some product for the, the studies that we were doing where we were told that Swiffers are not, in fact, a veterinary product. <laughs> so we had to go buy them ourselves. And as we were checking out at Target, the checkout lady said to Dr. Morello, wow, you must really think Swiffers are great. Because <laughs> she had like this giant conveyor belt full of Swiffers. Um, they do work great, though, for collecting samples from the environment. And they're really, that's just what we use now. We always use Swiffers. And um, you can take them and inoculate the cultures as usual. So culture results are going to start coming in within probably five days, sometimes even sooner. Um, this picture right here shows you what early growth looks like. So we see that the dermatophyte test media is turning from orange to red. And we can start to see this kind of white to clear, kind of fingery growth. Again, I would never call this culture positive on the basis of seeing this. But I would call it what? Suspect. Great. So this is one that probably by day three, maybe day four, I would call this one suspect. It's important to understand the difference between suspect and positive. Many animals that you'll say are, are suspect at day four, day five, will be negative at day seven or by day 10. So we, but we want to be able to identify that that's something that's suspicious, and we look at it. This is a really simple process, this first sort of cut between not suspect and suspect. We just look at the cultures every day. And if it's red and has white growth, it goes into the suspect pile. And so it's really just a question of sort of sorting through. And then you start to look at the cultures. Culture interpretation, again, I'm going to beat you over the head with this because it's so important to me. It just needs to be done. They need to be looked at under a microscope. Um, microsporum species are the most common, and gypsum by a long shot. I'm sorry, and canis 
by a long shot. And gypsum you'll see, but what we say really is if you can recognize canoes and rowboats, and even if you can't tell the difference between canoes and rowboats, and I'll come back and tell you what that means, you're going to be doing okay. The trichophyton species, they may be pathogenic, but it is so much less common. And in my experience, in fact, trying to identify all those different trichophyton species without really understanding which, or being able to differentiate between which ones are pathogenic and which ones aren't, often causes more problems in shelters than just saying you're not going to worry too much about trichophyton. Um, so again, to do this microscopic evaluation, you need scotch tape and um, microscope slides. You can use lactophenol cotton blue, which is lovely, and it actually makes things um, really pop out. It really stains things in a lovely way. Once, when I was out of lacto cotton blue, I used lumethylene blue, which lots of shelters have, just as like a general stain. And I was like, wow, <laughs> this works fine. And so even if you don't have like the thing that everybody says that you need, you'll probably be OK using something else. And I've actually even gotten pretty good at just looking at them without stain, too. Um, you can drop your condenser down, and you'll be able to see things that way. But again, the pictures I'm going to show you are pictures that I took with new methylene blue, um, so everybody can see what they look like with the less fancy, like the economy stain. Um, so in order to do it, you do um, you take a drop of stain and you put it on the microscope slide. You gently touch the tape to the colony, sticky side down. You place the tape sticky side down over the stain, and then depending on that's usually where I end it. Some people will take a drop of stain and put that on top and then put a cover slip on top. I tend not to do that very often. I want to make a comment here. These are, in fact, my fingers. Um, and I am not wearing gloves. And I'll tell you that the reason that they are my fingers and I am not wearing gloves is that if you try to do this wearing gloves, the tape will get all stuck to your fingers <laughs> and you won't be able to do it. <laughs> And so maybe there's people out there who can do it with gloves on. Karen and I are not those people. Um, and so what we do is we do it this way. The tape is, I hope you'll see, really protecting my finger. I'm very, very gently touching that so I'm not wiping my finger all over it. And I wash my hands immediately afterwards. If you're ever feeling like you want a great challenge, try doing it with gloves. <laughs> um, but it just it doesn't work very well. This is what you'll see when you look on the microscope slide if it is positive. So this is what we call a canoe. This is Microsporum canis. It has this long kind of canoe shape with the thwarts that go across and this kind of bulbous end. Um, and Microsporum gypsum looks a little bit more like a short squat canoe or a rowboat. So if all you were able to do is recognize these, you'd be 90% probably of the way there in terms of being able to do microscopic identification. The rest is like details and complication. And it's great to be able to figure those things out. And they can be really frustrating, so I'm not trying to totally minimize those. But if all you could do is this, you're going to be a long way there. Yes? She sent those samples out because lots of people don't feel um, comfortable doing this microscopic evaluation. And so I'm being a little flip with you guys now, but it's partly because I don't want you to think this is really hard. It's not really hard. And I remember getting out of that school and thinking that both direct exam and microscop microscopic evaluation was going to be really hard. And I'm lucky. I was working with Karen, and she's like, oh, it's not hard. Just do it. And so I just did it, and then I found it wasn't hard. But a lot of people think it's really going to be hard and really challenging. One thing I'll say is that I did notice that it's a lot harder if you don't incubate your cultures warm enough, because they tend not to make these nice macroconidia. So they need to be incubated around 68 to 70 degrees. Yeah, a question from Iowa. We put it on a dermatophyte test media. And that's pretty much what we use almost all the time. Sometimes if we need to really do some kind of differentiation, then we'll use different media. But that's not me. That's Dr. Moriello, and that's her in her lab. It's not something that we recommend for shelters. So we always use dermatophyte test media. 
Okie doke. So now you've got your culture results. If it's positive, the next step is to start looking at how many colonies were formed. We use a pathogen scoring system, so anything that's over here in the 1 to 9 section would be a P1 or a P2 for us, and then anything over here would be a P3, but you can use colony forming units as well. And the truth is, we don't treat P1s and P2s very differently, but it does give us a sort of different level index of suspicion. Okay. Um, so if they have a low number of colony forming units, then we say, well, okay, but did they have lesions? In some cases, the only cats you cultured did have lesions, so that's an easy one to answer. But sometimes what you really need to do is go back to that animal and say, does this animal have lesions? Because sometimes the lesion wasn't identified the first time you looked at them, but now you've got a little better hindsight, you can go back and look at them again and say, do they really have lesions? If they don't have any lesions and they have a low number of colony forming units, we're going to just treat them as a fomite. We call that a dust mop. We say that's an animal that probably just had fungus on it on its coat and just let them go. Um, if they have lesions, then we're going to treat them as truly infected. So lesions and a positive culture equals high risk. There were a couple of questions. Over here. It really varies. So the question is, when the plates turn red, how often is it ringworm? And it's something that it really depends on the sources that you're sampling, right? So if you're sampling in a shelter where there's lots of ringworm and the plates turn red, 90% of the time it's probably going to be ringworm, <laughs> maybe. But there's no way of telling because it's just a metabolic thing that's happening. It's the way the fungus is metabolizing what's in the, the media. and so. In some cases, there's lots of different fungus that will turn the media red. Ringworm happens to be one of those things. Does that make sense? So this was, I mean, when I was in Ontario, there had just been a company that makes test media, had gone through, and was talking to all the veterinarians about our test media actually can differentiate. But it, it can't. And so you need to look on the microscope. Okay. Culture results include environmental samples, which will come later. So this is just an example for us of a, of a shelter that we worked with. And you can see they had what we call P3. They had heavy growth from this one room. This is a case where this would raise our index of suspicion of what's going on. Step 10 is shuffle again. This is now that we've got our culture results. Now we really are, we know who's positive. We know who we're saying is low risk. And we may either just give them a topical treatment and move them on, or we may not. Uh, we may just let them move on their way. Clean like heck again after this shuffle. Yes. Um, yeah, so the question is about specific cleaning protocols, which I'm not going to go into a huge amount today. What I am going to talk about is, what I'm going to say is that the most important thing in cleaning is actually to think about mechanically removing the spores. Like, think about them as though they were dust and get those out of the environment. So we know that bleach at 1 to 10, at 10 minutes in a test tube, will kill ringworm spores. The possibility of achieving that same kind of contact in a, you know, in a real life environment is, is pretty low. And even if you could, you don't want to soak everything around you in bleach at 1 to 10 for 10 minutes. And so really what you need to do is remove it. If you look for areas where hair collects, where dust and dirt collect, and you clean like heck, that usually is, is what, we, what we want. So this is the old treatment area that is now gone at the Dane County Humane Society. But this is an important step, is really thinking about, can you create a treatment area as part of your ringworm response? Because it's a lot easier to respond to an outbreak if one of the options is treatment. Um, it's much more difficult if it's not. One of the things, and you can apply these rules about outbreaks to almost any disease where you're managing an outbreak, is that using these good steps to diagnose and really understand 
the scope of the problem, what it often does is it often leaves you in a situation where you have a handful of animals who need treatment or need special care or need monitoring versus a shelter full. And so if we can do all this evaluation and figure out, oh, there's eight cats who really need treatment for ringworm, that's often doable. Whereas if there is 800 cats, it's often not doable. So that's the reason that following this kind of systematic approach can really be incredibly life-saving. And the key features to note in here is first that it was a really ugly pink trailer. <laughs> and second is that it's really not fancy at all. The ringworm treatment center at the County Humane Society right now is pretty fancy, but it didn't start that way, and it doesn't really need to be really fancy at any shelter. So this is the, these are the housing units. They're bigger than normal cages because we knew that the animals were going to be having a long-term stay during their treatment. It has a red line here that defines the difference between the clean area and a dirty area. So everything inside of here is dirty, including this sink that they use for dipping the animals. And outside of this is clean, so everything stays behind that, that comes into this area. They were able to, in that little trailer, they were able to treat 15 animals, 15 housing units at a time, um, with kittens about two to three per cage. And they're able to treat you know, hundreds of animals a year through that because they had really great practices and short times to cure. So as you're doing treatment and cleaning, you want to treat and clean in order of infectious potential. So basically, whoever came in last is going to get cleaned and treated last, and whoever is about ready to go, um, should, go um, should go first. This is a question we get all the time. Can we just treat in foster care? And again, it's really an important question to ask. What is safe? This is my cat after she fell in the bathtub. Um, <laughs> she was not safe. Um, but you know, can we keep them away from other pets and children, immune compromised people? Dr. Moriello and I have had some real interesting conversations about this because one of the things she said is, you know, well, I don't want to tell people that they can never treat cats with ringworm in foster care because I have clients who treat their cats with ringworm in their own home. And so, yes, it can be done. Yes, you need to be careful doing it. Um, because what you can often do, especially if you're responding to an outbreak, is take a centralized outbreak that can be controlled and completely decentralize it into the community. So you want to be careful not to do that. So it's all about risk. No uninformed adopters. We don't want to adopt ringworm out to people without telling them. Um, so we really want to be careful about it. All right, we have 10 minutes left just to go through some really quick treatment basics. The idea that I always talk about when I'm talking about treatment is that what you want to do is make a sandwich. It just helps me remember. You want a topical treatment coming from the outside and an oral systemic treatment coming from the inside. And the skin is kind of in the middle. The fungus is in the middle. The fungus sandwich, I guess. Even though I think this was, I got this from the internet, I think it's actually a marshmallow fluff sandwich. Um, the public published protocol that we published is um, from, from the clinical trials that we've done in shelters is lime sulfur at 8 ounces to a gallon twice weekly until cure is confirmed. And at the same time, oral itraconazole daily for 21 days. With this protocol, we were able to define cure as two consecutive negative cultures each taken a week apart. Um, that's with this protocol. And the reason that we were able to change that from the gold standard, which had been three cultures each at a week apart, each held for three weeks, is that we could look back at our data and see that once animals got to this place, they didn't look back. So we were able to sort of redefine that. Topical antifungal treatment is really important. This is a kitten from Dane County. Um, lime sulfur is so by far my favorite. Um, topical treatment. Again, the published clinical research with shelter animals in conjunction with itraconazole has demonstrated that we can have really, really rapid time to cure, excellent control of environmental contamination, even after just the first treatment. 
and demonstrated that adverse reactions are very, very rare, and no other product has yet been shown to have equivalent efficacy. It doesn't mean it never will, but when uh, people start asking me about using all sorts of different products, I'm just thinking, why? Because for me, watching this happening at Dane County, and you guys should all take some time and see what happens at Dane County, in general, it's like the easiest thing they treat. And so why mess with it? It's so easy. And they all get better. Other promising topicals are things like accelerated hydrogen peroxide. There's other things that we've done some research with. And they do work. It's not that they don't work. They just don't work as well, as solidly, as quickly as itraconazole and lime um, I just want to show you what we do for applying the topical. We call it, we make a dip sink. We call it dipping, but we're not really um, actually dipping the cats. Here's a bucket underneath the sink, and it's just got like a barn drain. Here's uh, Tom Kinsley, who was the originally called himself the dip. Um, <laughs> And he's using a garden sprayer in these little laundry tubs. And he's got the spray very close to the animal's body. The spray is warm. So cats really, you can see she's not thrilled. But it's not a giant nightmare. Um, if the solution is warm and the spray is not spraying at the cats, and instead it's sort of cascading over them, it really is not a giant nightmare for the cats at all. It's not hugely stressful. And they don't scream and cry and flail. Um, and go nuts. Um, it is nice, as this little guy is doing, is to give them a place to hold on. The triconazole uh, comes in these 100 milligram tablets designed for humans. Um, and what we do is basically split them up. We hold the capsules. These are my fingers again. Um, we hold the capsules like this. And we just dump the amount into pretty close to four even amounts. Um, liquid is available for dosing kittens, but it usually costs a little bit more than buying the capsules. So that's, that's like totally the cliff notes on treatment. Yes? Yes. So the question is, are we actually spraying the cats with lime sulfur solution? Yes. So we, and the, it's really important to coat the cat completely so that they soak to the skin. Um, and you don't want to pre-wet them, because if they're wet and then you apply it, you're actually diluting the solution. And when we first started out, what we wanted to try was four ounces to the gallon, and we didn't like the results we were seeing at all. And so we upped it to eight ounces to a gallon, and like everything clicked. Um, everything worked perfectly as soon as we, we raised it to that. Yeah. Yeah, so she's talking about if you're going to do an individual animal. You can do that, especially with little kittens. What we usually recommend, instead of actually sitting them in a tub, is to actually use like a really soaking wet towel and then kind of like squish it on them. Do you know what I mean? So you kind of drape them in it and squish and drape them on and squish. What you don't want to do is have like a giant dunking tub and like dunk one and set them aside and then the next one. You're laughing. That is how people used to do it really frequently. And cats really don't like that. Um, the so the um, sprayers will clog um, over time. But if you rinse them out every time with hot water after you're done using them, then they, the, the spraying tips last longer. OK, we're just about done. Step 12 is to develop a long-term response plan. And this is so important. Like You just went through this whole giant nightmare. And it's just sort of like what I was talking about, about being aware that an, another animal might come in. So develop a plan so that the animals are getting identified at intake. So screen on intake, visual, woods, culture, inflammatory lesions. Those are my three sort of intake highlights. Screen before rehousing. Protect the kittens. They're going to be the most likely animals to get infected. Isolate or separate suspects or affected cats. Treat with effective topicals. Monitor, monitor, monitor. And when I say that, what I mean is every time an animal moves from one place to another, I think of it as like a critical move. Before they go to foster, just look them over. Do they have any lesions? Before they go into a group room, look them over. Before they go to a satellite adoption center in a pet store, look them over. There's a question. 
So do we recommend to clip long-haired cats before dipping? We don't recommend to clip very often, um, especially not a medium hair cat. If what you're talking about gets to be like a Persian or something with really long hair, we often will recommend some clipping because what happens is over time their fur just gets matted and icky. It's not because they really, really have to be clipped, but they're hard to maintain. One of the reasons that we don't recommend clipping, and we thought we were going to <laughs> very early on, we had even set up a room where everybody was going to get clipped on their way into the treatment area, um, is that, first of all, we ended up not needing to, and so why do it? But second of all, there's a real danger of getting some significant thermal burns from clipper. Um, clippers get hot much faster than people realize, and I've actually seen um, really shocking results of deep thermal burns from clippers. So in general, we don't. Um, it can take like two to three weeks for those deep thermal burns to come up, too, um, and then the skin will just sort of fluff off, um, and it's it's awful. So in general, we don't. If they're really long, then we do. But again, we're not clipping them any closer than like what I would call a lion. So we're still leaving them fur on their body. We're just doing some clipping to shorten the hair and keep it from getting so matted. One of, I think, the most important uh, findings that Dr. Moriello and I had from doing all our initial field work in shelters was to find this bottom statement, which is that treatment improves volunteer and staff reporting dramatically. Um, and I, there's some people here who actually used to work at Dane County, and I see them sort of nodding. It used to be when there was a policy for recognizing and euthanize that nobody ever saw ringworms. Never. And when I was there after this program started, we'd have happy volunteers, you know, marching up to us with little ringworm infected kittens. Really, almost genuinely happy that they had ringworm because they knew they were going to go into this treatment program and they're going to get such excellent care and all this stuff. So it's really, really important to understand that. Um, intake quarantine, if you're going to do it, it would take two to three weeks. Can you really quarantine? It's usually not something that we would recommend unless there was a real important reason to do it. So in summary, exam screening is a powerful tool for prevention. It is cheap, fun, and easy. So please, it's really important. Proceed with caution if you think there is an outbreak, and please make sure that's really what it is. Um, and please consider whether the real answer is to just investigate further and find out whether what you really need to do is just treat a handful of animals. Um, outbreak response can be devastating and it can be costly, so be careful. Again, just please remember this, that lime sulfur and itraconazole works great <laughs> and it's not very expensive. People think of itraconazole as incredibly expensive, but what we're talking about is a 21-day dosing for most cats. It usually costs less than $25 to treat a cat. Um, thanks for caring. This is Ken. He was our first customer. Uh, I think he's actually sitting on Dr. Moriello's lap in this picture. Um, he's the first one into the ringworm trailer. And uh, thanks to the ASPCA for making my position possible. I have time to answer a couple questions. I know we're right over, so I don't know if Iowa, if you guys can stay or if you have questions, but I know if you guys want to stay, I can answer a couple questions. OK, great. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? Did we get them all? Sarah. You know, the handy thing about ringworm is that it's got that two to three week incubation period. So. It's, yeah, so the question was, do, uh, is there a lower age for itraconazole? Correct me if you feel differently than me. The handy thing is it's got a two to three week incubation period. So you don't really see ringworm in very, very young neonatal kittens. Um, we've used it in kittens up from four weeks up, and we've never seen a problem. Would I use it in a three week old kitten? If I really believed the three week old kitten had ringworm, I probably would. I've never had to. Have you? Yeah. From their mom. Yeah. Or, I mean, in an orphan kitten, you might, but then, like, where'd they get exposed? So, we just, like, 
it's been pretty simple for us because we know it's okay. Like we've used it in four week olds and they're totally fine and we just never have had to use it anybody younger than that. It's another one of those things to keep in mind when people call you and say, I've got a two week old kitten and it's got ringworm. Probably not. <laughs> No problem. Treat the mom. Uh, we usually don't treat the babies with oral because we assume they're not infected. And really, truly, so we did we did this study right here. Dr. Moriello did it with some cats that came in that were ringworm infected that came in for junior surgery. And what she did is we she dipped the cats and she cultured them every single day to see. And like the day after you dip them, they're negative. And they're negative for several days. And then you dip them again. So, like, we've never, knock, knock for Mike, oh, here's Liz. We've never had one of the volunteers at the Dane County program get ringworm. Like, when we culture the environment of the treatment center at Dane County, it's never positive. Because they're getting that, that's the reason that you need to use that effective topical treatment. It just knocks down the contamination into the environment so quickly. So it's also going to knock down the likelihood that those babies are going to get spores on them from their mom. Um, so, you know, if it seems really necessary, you could certainly use a little rag and put lime sulfur on them, but it's, it's probably not necessary. Anything else? Thanks, you guys.